one of the interesting things going on these days in the study of many diseases, including but not limited to Alzheimer's disease, is our ability to predict future diseases getting better, not because people are all that deeply interested in predicting future disease, but because as you learn more about the etiology or the natural history, the causes of diseases, which you want to do in order, one hopes, to be able to treat them, prevent them, cure them, and so on, many times you learn things that will help you see early stages or help you predict who's going to be liable to the disease. And if you want to do research, human clinical trials with diseases, you're often better off if you can do those trials with subjects who are likely to be getting the disease. So for reasons not related directly to a desire to be able to predict for prediction's sake, we're learning more about diseases in ways that gives us the ability to predict. Like many things, though, this kind of knowledge is not single-use knowledge. It may be great to do clinical trials, but it may also have some other broader social implications. So the point of this panel is to talk about advances in our ability to predict one particular and particularly interesting disease, Alzheimer's disease, and what kind of implications that may have both within medicine and outside medicine. Uh, we've got a great panel uh, set up today. You all have uh, the bios that uh, shows everyone, so I won't repeat that information. I'll just turn things over directly to Dr. Frank Wilder. Well, thank you, Hank. So we're, today we're focused on predicting Alzheimer's disease. So we thought we'd start off by just talking about what Alzheimer's disease is in, in the first place. Uh, before we talk about this image here, I'll just introduce a, a few terms. Uh, we see quite a few patients here at the Stanford Center for Memory Disorders uh, with Alzheimer's and various forms of dementia. And one common question is, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? So what does the term uh, dementia mean? And generally, the term dementia means is a cognitive loss in two or more domains of cognition. The domains of cognition would be memory, uh, and that would be the most common uh, domain to be affected uh, in a dementia early on. But other domains would be visual spatial skills, verbal skills, judgment, um, executive function. Um, any one of those domains can be affected. So if we have a loss of cognition in two or more domains, and that loss of cognition is severe enough to cause a significant loss of day-to-day -day function, um, we would describe that as a state of dementia. And the caveat is it's an, it's an otherwise alert patient. It's not an immediate explanation like a drug side effect, um, et cetera. And we simply say that patient has a dementia. Now, when we say loss of day-to-day -day function, generally significant things. If the person is still working, they may no longer be able to do their job well. Their social interactions may have changed. Uh, they may have handed over their finances to their spouse. Uh, those are the kinds of changes in, in function we're, we're looking for. Now, there are dozens of causes of dementia. The job of the neurologist, or sometimes they're the geriatrician or the psychiatrist, is to figure out which of the dozens of causes of dementia does this person have who's sitting in my clinic here. Uh, but the big one is Alzheimer's, which accounts for two-thirds of all dementias. So generally, we're talking about Alzheimer's disease. There are other neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, there are endocrine conditions, for example, low B12, low thyroid, et cetera, et cetera, can contribute uh, to a dementia. A brain tumor can, a series of strokes can. Those things are generally pretty easy to rule out, and then we're left with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So what happens in the brain in Alzheimer's disease? On, the, on this side of the brain here, on your left, we have a normal-looking brain. On the right side is an Alzheimer's brain. And there are two pathologic hallmarks of, of this disease. The accumulation of amyloid plaques. Amyloid uh, is made up of fragments of a normally occurring protein. <coughs> and this fragment of this normally occurring protein is building up in unusually high levels. And that protein fragment is toxic to neurons and ends up killing them. And it appears as spots in the brain to a pathologist. There are also invisible forms of amyloid building up here. And as that amyloid builds up, it's thought to trigger uh, the ab an abnormal state of this protein called tau, which is inside the neurons. And as that tau um, aggregates, it's toxic uh, to the neurons in their connection. So this is what a pathologist would see looking at the brain. The brain finally starts to shrink, but that's not until uh, mid or, or later stages of the disease. And um, again, just showing these, these things, uh, again, from a, a more a microscopic <coughs> real view, those brown spots are the amyloid plaques. 
It's nice to see them. You read about amyloid in the news all the time. Maybe we'll talk about some of the recent things coming out during the past week. And those amyloid plaques are accumulating. Uh, eventually, uh, this uh, protein called tau, which is inside the neurons, um, gets abnormally phosphorylated, it accumulates in these toxic uh, aggregates, and so those dark colored neurons are filled with tau. Those neurons will eventually degenerate and die, releasing that tau, and that may go on to affect um, uh, other neurons, but the, the two pathologic uh, hallmarks of, the, of this disorder. And basically, we're, we talk about neurons quite a bit. There's a neuron. It has this beautiful dendritic tree that other neurons are connecting on. It has this axon. And this axon eventually hooks up to another neuron, and it does, throw through, does so through this synapse. And you can see how many hundred billion neurons in our brain, hundred trillion synapses. And in Alzheimer's disease, these synapses are particularly vulnerable. This, this thing called the spine, this nub here, is, is extremely delicate. Um, and if you lose your spine, you lose your synapse. And when you lose your synapse, you start to lose your memory function and other things like that. And there's some picture of those little green nubs, our spines. The one on the left is how our brains looked when we were young, in our 20s. Um, after our 20s, as is, is, is probably been discussed, we get this gradual age-associated uh, cognitive decline. But as we age, or especially with Alzheimer's disease, we begin to lose those spines. Um, and then, of course, we, we're losing the synaptic connections, particularly in Alzheimer's uh, disease. So what's really been uh, a paradigm shift in the past few years is sort of this idea that this disease is starting well before the symptoms. We, we didn't know that uh, before. So it, uh, to, uh, a way to uh, look at this, you get this amyloid accumulation during a time of normal cognition. And this might have started occurring 10 or 15 years before there's any cognitive complaint, any memory complaint at all. As that amyloid is silently accumulating, it begins to trigger this tau process that we, we talked about, this accumulation of too much phosphorylated tau in the neuron. But we're still no complaints. This person's still doing perfectly fine. But then finally, that process begins to trigger some early stages of, of degeneration. The neurons start to shrink a little bit. They're still there. They're still functioning. They might not be functioning quite normally. But eventually, we do start to have some memory loss. And if a person has just memory loss, so only cognitive compromise in one domain, and it's not affecting day-to-day -day function too much, we give them a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, MCI. You'll see that term more and more often uh, nowadays, mild cognitive impairment. They don't quite, quite reach that criteria for dementia that I talked about. They have MCI. And then finally, that, the memory loss is getting worse, this purple line here. Finally, it's severe enough, and then other cognitive domains may come in where we start to have the functional loss. They finally meet the criteria for an actual uh, dementia. <coughs> so traditionally, we thought this was the disease. We didn't know about any of this. But you can see that by the time we, we, the, we give that diagnosis in terms of traditional clinical criteria, it's actually quite late. And most of the trials that have been done have been done when, in people who have dementia. But guess what? We're, we're instituting these trials at this late, late stage, and there's probably a big reason why so many of the trials fail. So the big push now is how can we start trials earlier? In other words, how can we predict who will get this uh, disease would be the um, ideal thing to do. By the way, uh, mild cognitive impairment is probably three or four times more common than dementia. So to, in the United States, we have a, a, the Alzheimer's Association estimates 5.3 million Americans uh, with Alzheimer's disease. The numbers are, are, scar, are skyrocketing. There are probably three or four fold times that many people with mild cognitive impairment. Those MCI people, are, most of them are heading um, in this direction. So we're dealing with a, a landslide here. The total cost right now, 180 billion per year. It'll reach 1 trillion per year by, by 2050. That's not counting the $200 billion a year that's the value of the caregivers um, in, in this disease. So it's really taking up worldwide, we're up almost 40 million um, Alzheimer's uh, right now. And another favorite question, uh, what about, what if my, one of my parents has Alzheimer's disease? Of course, a, a common question. So we divide Alzheimer's into two types. They're the so-called sporadic late onset, generally starts after age 65. That's 95% of what we deal with, the sporadic Alzheimer's. All of us are susceptible to that. And then there's this 
5% of it, much more rare, a single gene causing the disease, onset in the 40s and 50s, a uh, different situation. But in going back to the sporadic, it's this APOE gene that's a big predictor. It's the big risk factor. I think Jeff might talk about that a little bit more. If you have no family history of Alzheimer's, your lifetime risk is about 15%. Um, you can get your DNA tested. This APOE gene comes in three kinds, two, three, and four. Nobody knows why there's not a one. They did that just to make it confusing, but two, three, or four. If you have the type four, you're at much higher risk for Alzheimer's. You can get this done commercially by 23andMe or Nav Navigenics. We can talk about whether you'd want to get that done. If, if you have no family history, if you don't have the E4, 9 down to 9% lifetime risk. If you have the E4, up to 30% lifetime risk. Here's where it gets scary. If one of your parents has Alzheimer's, if you have one e copy of E4, we have two copies of each gene, up to 45% lifetime risk. And if you're unlucky enough to have both of your APOE alleles being E4, 60% lifetime risk. So um, you can see what this, the implications of finding out about this information has. So as a neurologist, when we see a patient we, who's complaining of memory loss, we do what's called a dementia workup. We take a very careful history. There are nuances in the history that help us figure out what's going on. We do a careful neurologic exam. That helps us figure out what's going on. We get a few blood tests. We do an MRI scan. MRI scan can't show Alzheimer's disease. It's used to rule out other things. They don't have a brain tumor. They aren't having strokes, et cetera. And we have about 85% diagnostic accuracy. And we use it, formally use the term probable Alzheimer's disease. You wouldn't know 100% unless you did an autopsy and looked at the brain. There's no brain scan now that's 100% accurate for diagnosing this. There's no blood test, but we're working on both here at Stanford, and it's just a matter of time before we have those um, available. We have some FDA-approved therapies, but basically these drugs just boost the neurotransmitters at that dying synapse can help cognition a little bit temporarily, but you're not slowing the underlying uh, degeneration that's occurring here. So we call that symptomatic therapy. We're all working on a therapy that will actually slow or stop or reverse the, the, the degeneration. Here, we're back to those amyloid plaques in the brain. There are many approaches now to try to reduce these plaques. One is to actually immunize the person against the amyloid and have your own immune system attack the plaques and try to remove them. They don't remove it entirely. In the upcoming year, we'll hear about the results of some of these trials. But they aren't not available yet, just in terms of trials. And uh, finally, if you want, we can talk a little bit about the, the news that was in the, came out um, Thursday about um, this vexerotine. Um, it's a drug that's available to, to treat a skin form of cancer, a lymphoma. <coughs> Uh, that actually was found to reduce the amyloid plaques, the little red dots, um, in, a, in an Alzheimer's mouse brain. Um, and so there's a lot of excitement about, gee, is this drug, well, can this drug be a treatment for Alzheimer's disease? So I'll stop there. That's a, just a brief tour of what Alzheimer's is, how we deal with it as a neurologist, and what's going on in the brain. Thanks, Frank. Well, we now need to figure out how to turn the projector off so we can flip the screens. And, and actually, I was going to draw on the on the board, but uh, one of Frank's slides would actually be perfect for me. So I think oh, I'll just, okay. if it's okay with him, sure. the timeline. Oh, sure. So I thought it was going to be multimodal. There you go. Yeah, that would be a good idea. <coughs> Great, thanks very much, and that was a, a great inter introduction to Alzheimer's disease. I'm a clinician, so I see uh, patients who come to clinic because they or their primary care doctors are concerned about Alzheimer's disease, and they all want the Alzheimer's test. And as uh, Dr. Longo pointed out, we don't have that yet, although uh, we're working on it. Um, as, as Hank pointed out, there's a lot that's been discovered accidentally. Um, sort of in this uh, time range in terms of uh, things that can contribute to a prediction of risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, I would counter one thing that he said, though, and that's that there's a lot of deliberate effort now to develop those predictive technologies because um, we do think that uh, Alzheimer's disease treatments are going to be much more effective when they're delivered to people at an earlier stage of their disease. 
uh, just as Frank pointed out. Um, and we think that there may be other values, and, and a lot of patients come to us and say that it would be valuable to them to be able to predict um, uh, what their risk is for Alzheimer's disease. So let me talk about what we can do now and what we're likely to be able to do in coming years. Um, and I think a part of our discussion today should be on what should we do, um, because those might, there might be slightly different answers to those questions. So what can we do? So amyloid, the deposition of beta amyloid in the brain is probably one of the first things that happens uh, in the development of Alzheimer's disease. And it probably begins at least a decade before the first day that we misplace our keys, long, long before uh, you know, the symptoms are full blown. Um, what we have now, so there are a couple ways to assay uh, what's going on with amyloid in the brain. One very exciting method is uh, called amyloid PET imaging. What this involves is uh, it's a drug that actually specifically binds to those amyloid plaques that Frank showed you. If you inject this into a patient and you apply a little radioactive tracer atom on it, a, a radioactive fluoride atom, you let it swim around the body and find any amyloid, and then you take a PET scan of the brain, which is basically a radiation detector and you basically ask, did this drug find any amyloid plaques in the brain? Uh, so this technology has now been around for about a decade in a research setting. It's likely to be FDA approved either first or second quarter of this year um, for, uh, for use in the clinics. So, and, and from, you know, from all this research, I, I have every confidence that uh, that this method, this amyloid PET imaging, will accurately tell you whether you have amyloid plaques in the brain. That's different, though, from saying that you have Alzheimer's disease. Remember I said that this is a very early step in the development of Alzheimer's disease, this accumulation of amyloid plaques. At least 30% of people 70 and older who are absolutely healthy, have absolutely normal cognition, they have no complaints, about their thinking, they score normally on testing. At least 30% of them have amyloid plaques in their brain. Um, there's some plus or minus on, on that because we need to do more research on those people. And the other thing we need to do is to follow them into the future because one lingering question that bugs me and bugs a lot of other researchers in the field is are all of those people who are amyloid positive gonna go on to get Alzheimer's disease? We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, and, uh, you know, at least at, 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 the, at the end of the longest longitudinal study that's been done so far, sure, having amyloid plaques in your brain is not good, and I'd rather not be part of that 30%. And some of them do go on to develop Alzheimer's disease, but there are still people left over at the end of those longest studies that are still healthy, still normal, no complaints, score normally on testing. So we don't know what's going to happen to people who are amyloid positive but healthy today. Um, the other caveat about this testing is it doesn't tell you what else is going on in the brain. Um, as Frank mentioned, there's a long list, 100, 200 other different causes of dementia. And just because you have amyloid plaques doesn't mean you don't also have something else that's going on in the brain that could be the cause of your symptoms. Uh, I told you that there were two ways to, to assay how much amyloid you have in your brain. And the second way is by doing a spinal tap. So you can do a spinal tap, obtain cerebral spinal fluid, and you can actually chemically measure the level of amyloid in, that, in, in, the, in the spinal fluid directly. Um, for reasons that we don't entirely understand, when you accumulate amyloid plaques in your brain, the concentration of amyloid in the spinal fluid goes down, perhaps because the brain is soaking it up and holding on to it and it's not getting cleared out of into the cerebral spinal fluid and back into the systemic circulation. Can I just ask quickly, sure. do you find amyloid in these tests? Do you look at other parts of the body? So you can, the brain? that's a great question, and you can check amyloid in the bloodstream, and there is evidence that... How about the other organs? So am, beta, this particular kind beta. of amyloid, beta amyloid does not accumulate, for instance, beta. in the kidneys or in... Uh, the heart tissue. There are other kinds of amyloid that do accumulate in those tissues, but beta amyloid doesn't seem to. Uh, it is present in the bloodstream, just as a 
chemicals circulating in the blood. Um, how is MRI uh, accumulating the body? How, this, uh, this accumulate? how does the beta amyloid start to accumulate? How does it accumulate in the body? Where did it come from? It's an endogenous, so we all have amyloid beta in our brain. It's normal, and it probably plays a normal function. Why it gets, why it accumulates, and why it aggregates is a matter of, there, there are, there's a lot that's known about it and a lot that's still not known. Um, but the basic answer to that question is we don't know. You can measure tau in the cerebral spinal fluid, um, uh, just like you can measure amyloid. And tau does go up in Alzheimer's disease, but it also goes up in a lot of other disorders. And so it's not specific for Alzheimer's disease. What about brain atrophy? Well, we know that if you take 100 normal people and do MRI scans on them and 100 patients with Alzheimer's disease and take averages of those two sets of MRIs and compare them together, the patients with Alzheimer's disease or even patients with myocognitive impairment will have, on average, smaller brains, a smaller hippocampus, which is the organ within the brain that stores new memories. Um, but it's very difficult to, or you can't, in fact, take an individual and do an MRI on an individual, measure the size of their brain, and say, you know, this is the size of a brain with Alzheimer's disease versus this is the size of a normal brain. It's, you can't do that on an individual by individual level. We have neuropsychological tests. Those are also not specific. They can tell you that, in fact, you have an objective memory problem. Um, but Again, by the time you have a neuropsychological problem, you're in this phase of the disease at least. You're at least in the mild cognitive impairment stage. So the tools that I've talked about that are readily available right now, amyloid PET imaging, amyloid and tau spinal fluid biomarkers, and MRI volumetric uh, measurements, these are all clinically available now, but none of them is specific. Amyloid PET imaging is very sensitive for the disease, but it's going to pick up a lot of false positives also. Frank mentioned APOE4 testing. So this is also clinically available. You can get an APOE4 genotype. But all you can tell somebody is that, you know, if you have a family member who's got Alzheimer's and you are unlucky enough to have two copies of APOE4, all I can tell my patient is that you have a 60% lifetime risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. It means you have a 40% lifetime risk of not developing it. Are you going to develop it? I don't know. Um, so it's, it's a matter of probabilities. So we have learned a lot about being able to predict the disease, but there are a lot of uncertainties. And there is no single test that simply provides a yes-no determination. Um, folks are working on that. Uh, Tony weiss Corey here at Stanford is working on serum biomarkers. Uh, Michael Gracious and I are working on better MRI biomarkers of this disease, and I agree with Frank. I think in the coming uh, uh, years, we're going to have much more positive uh, biomarkers available. Um, but we don't have them just yet. <coughs> A separate discussion is, should we be doing these tests? Great. And it's to that discussion that I think we'll begin to turn as we move from the scientists to the lawyers. Um, I think uh, it's fair to say for the next two talks, assume that there is a test that's pretty good at telling you whether or not you are likely to get Alzheimer's disease, whether you're highly likely to get it or whether you're highly unlikely to get it. And with that lead in, let me turn things over to Mike. Okay, so uh, I'm the sort of practical legal perspective on this. So the question is, if you may be impractical, I didn't suggest that. <laughs> Take your implications where you will. Um, but what we do is uh, actually work with, uh, we, we do estate planning, uh, rich history in dealing with long-term care, countless Alzheimer's uh, families have come to us where there's been a diagnosis of dementia of whatever type. So we have like 20, 30 years of experience dealing with these actual issues. Uh, one question that I actually thought uh, Hank would ask or somebody would ask, um, and, and I think I, I will, is if you could take a test right now and know, let's say to a 90% certainty that you would or would not have Alzheimer's, how many of you would take it? How much does it cost? <laughs> Free. 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 Uh-huh. 
and a lot of ambivalence too, by the way. I saw a lot of laughing and you know, like, so. Um, Ask how many wouldn't take it. Well, I, okay, how many would not take it as a certainty? Yeah, that's the, you, you don't want any of them. No, it's really about 50-50. It might be the younger folks who are more inclined to say no. I, you know, I just saw a group up there that said no. Is there any risk for taking the test? Well, we're going to set aside all that and just say, because I need to focus on the legal planning side. We'll just say, could you know? So, okay, so, so let, let, let me go on. Uh, there's not all that much time. I did put together a short paper that I understand is out there, and you can look at that later on. Um, I'm glad this is up here. Ideally, you know, while all of us are at the far left side of that time spectrum, we're going to do our planning, our legal planning. So let's just make this an obvious point to underscore that, um, that everybody should do some basic things. Everybody in the room should have a power of attorney, an advanced directive, a living trust. I mean, you don't wait for a crisis. I think we all know that, right? So we're all going to take care of that. I'm sure everybody in the room has because you're educated, motivated individuals. But now we'll move on and let's say that there, there, now there is a diagnosis. And one of the most obvious concerns is the cost of care. Uh, it's not inevitable that you'll need a higher level of care, but it's highly, highly likely. It might mean, mean uh, more care at home, uh, assisted living of some sort, at some point perhaps a skilled nursing facility where the cost, in New York City it's getting, in some facilities are fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 a month. It's not that much here, maybe $7,500 to $9,500. It's a lot of money. And you know, no matter how large you think your estate might be, it's going to suffer if there's going to be years in a skilled nursing facility. So, so you start to worry about that. It's just absolutely inevitable. So, so when there is a diagnosis, the first thing is if you have not done your basic estate planning, I mean, you have to deal with these issues. You have to acknowledge, as we all do, but here now the issue has presented itself very starkly, you have to acknowledge that at some point you're going to lose the ability to make your own decisions, to manage your assets, to make health care decisions, et cetera. So even if you have done these documents, you really want to re-examine them. Have you named individuals you can truly trust? So often when we do a power of attorney, we name our oldest kid. We give them the power and the authority. There's not thought given to whether they're really the best person. Well, now, you know, it's serious. The, the rubber has hit the road, as the saying goes. So you're going to re-examine all of these questions. Are they the people, is this the individual you can trust to make proper decisions, to be an advocate? Are they going to get the kind of sophisticated help they need so that they can take care of you as time moves along? What are your documents going to say? Um, simple standard forms are absolutely inadequate for, for all of us, but, uh, but particularly in situations like this. Uh, to do something like asset transfers, which I'll get to in just a moment, you can't use a power of attorney, for example, to transfer someone's assets unless it is explicit in giving the authority. So there's, and there's more requirements than that. So you're not in a normal planning world. It's, you know, everything is, is heightened. You have to be more careful. You have to be much, much more proactive. Okay. So how is the cost of care paid? Just a little bit of background. Um, if you should be uh, fortunate enough to have long-term care insurance and it's a good policy, well, that's your primary source. A good policy would pay for home care, uh, perhaps assisted living as well, and skilled nursing. Will it be enough? Is the company still solvent? I mean, there's a lot of questions there. Some have, some have gone out of business. They've stopped providing, even, even though they entered the market in California with a, with a flourish and a lot of promises. So there's a lot of worries about that. Uh, your pocket is the first. Sooner or later, it's going to come out of your pocket. You know, Medicare does, does not, does not pay the ongoing cost of nursing home care. It may pay for a very short period of time. And um, poll after poll, uh, they teach us that the majority of folks over the age of 65, I've seen so many polls, still believe that Medicare is going to pay the cost of nursing home care, which means they don't plan. You know, they've got this false positive, so to speak. And they, they, they've got this impression and understanding that's absolutely wrong. And it becomes a crisis later on if they don't do any appropriate planning. So uh, uh, before getting to Medicaid, which is the source of last resort, there are veterans benefits. Uh, you, not very well known. There's an aid and attendance program it, it can pay. You have to be a veteran uh, serving at time of war. And there are many, many, many times of war or a spouse. And uh, qualifying for this program is not very difficult, frankly, if you just take the appropriate steps. And it can, what it does is it sends a check to the house, to the person, for sixteen to $1,850 a month in most cases. And then you spend it on, on uh, caregiving. Uh, 
you, you have to show that you need assistance with what are called the you know, activities of daily living. Most of us in the room know that term, ADLs. Uh, it's part of long-term care insurance. It finds its way into, into the vocabulary and the discussion uh, inevitably. So you do have to show that you, you need assistance with the activities of daily living. The asset uh, criteria are very generous. They're, they're not a problem. You can get to the point of eligibility with, with some ease. The um, uh, source of last resort is always Medicaid. Uh, we call it Medi-Cal here in California. And it's the program that pays uh, for nursing home care for most individuals. If you go into, if you look at the nursing home population as a whole, a significant majority all over the country, uh, the cost of care is paid exclusively or substantially by the uh, federal Medicaid program, which again, because we're cute and creative in California, we don't call it Medicaid, we call it Medi-Cal. Okay, but it's the same thing. Okay? So it's a needs-based program. You have to qualify for it by taking certain steps. Okay. So those are, that, that's how you can look at the cost of care. So, so now, what, what might you do? So you got a little bit of background. You've, you've had the diagnosis. And you're still aware. You know, it's a, early on. We hope, uh, we hope the time will get earlier and earlier. You know, if, we, if we have it, we want to know so that we can plan. Now, again, I'm just talking about the legal planning side of things. So the first thing I put down in my little outline is to enjoy life. I mean, one reason to know is if there's all these things you've always wanted to do, God, do them. You know, do them while you can, while you can thoroughly enjoy them. I, I can't overemphasize that. It might sound, maybe it's not a legal planning point. I guess it isn't, but it's the first thing that comes to my mind. That's for sure. Um, getting your estate planning in order, I've already mentioned that. And then you really start moving into the area of uh, the, the question of what are you going to do with your assets. Because of um, the law, because of government programs, it is possible to protect virtually every penny you have and have things organized so that when and if you need skilled nursing care, you will qualify for the Medicaid program. Without a doubt, it can be done. Currently, let me give you a, a little profile, and this will probably surprise you. Um, so let's say there's a, a married couple. Husband goes into the nursing home. Wife is still living at home. They have um, uh, a home in Palo Alto. It's worth, I don't know, whatever, $1.5 million. Doesn't matter what it's worth. Uh, an IRA with two IRAs, total of $500,000 and about $113,000 in cash. Okay? So this is not a small estate by any measure. It's about, what is it, about 1.8 million? That husband in that nursing home is going to qualify for Medi-Cal immediately without taking any planning steps whatsoever. So you know, this isn't you know, the lawyer pulling a rat out of the hat. This is just what the current eligibility criteria provide. I mean, that's surprising. So when people learn about this, why not? You know, why shouldn't you? And, and there are negatives. Not all nursing homes take Medi-Cal. There's other issues there, but, but it, it is a source of payment. Uh, a residence is what's called an exempt asset. It doesn't count. It doesn't interfere with eligibility. In California, any amount of money in an IRA, 401k, doesn't count as long as you're taking out the required minimum distributions. Other states vary. I'm talking about California for the moment. It's where we are. Um, and there's a rule which says that when one spouse is in the nursing home, the spouse at home gets to keep a minimum, an absolute minimum, of about $113,000 in her name without interfering with eligibility. Okay, so that's just the law without, you know, again, any planning whatsoever. Now, most people will want to do some planning because their assets are sooner or later going to be exposed. Um, one reason is that when a Medi-Cal, Medicaid recipient dies, the state Medicaid program is required to try to go after assets in their estate for reimbursement. So if you own the house at the time of your passing and you got Medicaid, the, the state has a claim. They can recover the money that the Medicaid program paid. So most people, I've never met one yet who doesn't, they want to protect their house. Can they do it? Yeah. How can they do it in California? They give it away. I mean, it's that simple. Now, that's California law today. Uh, there's a reference in the outline uh, to the Deficit Reduction Act of uh, 2005, which is the law in every state in the country except California. So. In other states, it's not so easy. This, the law is more restrictive. But even with this DRA, uh, even with its implementation, which should happen sometime this year, there are still many, many planning approaches that can be taken. The most obvious is remarkably simple. If you give away any amount of money, I don't care if it's a billion dollars, and you wait 
five years, this is under the strictest federal Medicaid law, you wait five years, all the gifting that you, you did becomes irrelevant to a Medicaid application. It doesn't matter how much you gave away. They, under the new federal law, which we do not have in California yet, they say, did you give anything away within the past five years? If it's five years and a day ago, you, know, you say no. Medicaid granted as long as you otherwise qualify. So the point is, everybody has the opportunity to plan and protect their assets. Okay. Then the question becomes, for whom? Um, the first answer to that, I believe, is for themselves. Uh, it is not a good idea to have your assets depleted and have no safety net. So part of the thinking and part of the planning is always, if you're going to transfer assets to ultimately protect them for your kids and your grandkids, how can you be as certain as possible that that money is going to be there for you if you need it? You know, because Medicaid is not perfect. You're going to have costs of living. It goes on and on and on. Because, you know, the first goal of, of estate planning is not to protect your money. The first goal of estate planning is to make you happy. It, it really is. Um, what combination of planning steps, maybe you're tax sensitive, maybe you're not. Maybe you want to protect the house, whatever it is. It's figuring out what's right for the individual. So everybody has to think this through. When I talk about transferring assets, by the way, you know, I, I say it quickly and casually because we don't have much time. There's a long discussion with somebody before we would ever recommend that they do that to make sure they're comfortable, they understand the risks, the gift tax implications, on and on, okay? So one approach that is often taken, and it makes just a lot of sense from kind of a multi-generational perspective, which is what we always try to take, is, uh, so here's a diagnosis. Assets can then be transferred to the kids or maybe to the most responsible child, and that child can then take all or some portion of those assets and put them into what is called the special needs trust. Any amount of money can be locked up at a special needs trust for the benefit of mom who just transferred that money, and it doesn't interfere with eligibility for Medicaid. See, so then you have a government program that will save you from losing all of your assets because you've taken steps to protect them, paying the primary cost of care, but it's not enough. You always want to have an ace in the hole, a safety net. So here's money sitting in this trust utterly devoted to you as long as you live. It's not until you're passing that those assets are going to go to the kids or to the grandkids. Um, by the way, you know, I always mention grandkids. Um, one of the great lines on this came from Gore Vidal. He said, uh, he said don't have children, have grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to save it for their grandchildren. Um, we, we usually use what are called dynasty trusts, by the way, which is how you really do save it for the, for the grandchildren, but that's, a, that's another topic. Um, so asset protection in the context of long-term care and qualifying for government programs. Another thing that if there is a diagnosis this year and you have, and you, let's say you're single, and you have an estate in excess of $1 million, and you have a diagnosis, well, let me shift it slightly. You believe your life expectancy is one or two years because of a cancer diagnosis or other. Because we're really talking about if you have a diagnosis, a high level of certainty, what might you do, how do you plan, how do you react? You know, anybody single, if they have maybe kids they trust, and they want to save money, just over a million now, they would give, if they're just focusing on tax planning for a moment, they would give everything away. Now, why is that? Uh, this year, uh, first time in American tax history, you can give away up to $5 million this year. For a couple, that's $10 million. And uh, you've saved that money forever. Next year, that level of protection goes all the way down to $1 million. So if you have a $2 million estate, you're single, you give it all away, you've saved it all. If you keep it till next year, you die, about $500,000 goes to the government. I mean, that's, that's radical stuff. So it's not the cost of care, but if you have a diagnosis of some nature and you see these issues that threaten your estate, the legacy you wanted to leave to your family, you're gonna be very interested in taking steps to protect yourself and ultimately, ultimately your kids. Um, another point that was made earlier I thought was really great that I think many of us would think in terms of a different kind of a legacy. Um, if we had the wherewithal, the inclination, we might want to establish a, a fund at a community foundation or set up a scholarship at you know, Stanford or something so that the name lives on or so that you've done something that makes you feel that you've contributed to the world. I mean, and you know, I've heard many people say that. Um, we have many, uh, two clients right now, actually one of whom is Stanford affiliated, where we're actually doing this kind of planning and ultimately the, the, their kids have no kids when their daughters both pass way in the distant future. All the money is going to come to, uh, uh, if there's any planned giving folks in the room, they'll love this, it's going to come to the uh, medical, uh, medical school. 
that's where uh, a couple million is going to go. So, you know, legacy planning. Uh, you know, what what makes sense for you, for you, the individual. Um, see, maybe the last couple of really quick comments, and then I'll get out of here. Is uh, uh, you know, I, many of you said you didn't want to know, and I think. At any age, there's a lot of us who wouldn't want to know. And, and uh, I don't think that's crazy. Uh, I do say on, on this little outline that the opportunity for planning is robust. It's amazing what the list, you know, we can, I mean, we can fix it. You know, we can solve whatever goal somebody has, we can come up with a strategy to, to achieve those goals without a doubt. But, you know, some of us would say, I'd rather not know because I just want to live my life without worrying about that. I just want to be, what it, you know, this could be somebody's perception. I just want it to be as normal as it can be. That's quality of life for me. As so many have said today, you know, I'm older, I'm satisfied, I'm happy. Let me just have that. Let me just stick with that. So I don't think it's wild and crazy to not be tested from a planning perspective. Of course you want to know. It's just a no-brainer, just an absolute no-brainer. And I'm not going through all the planning opportunities, of course, but you know, I hope I'm getting it across that there are countless opportunities that just make such sense when you have uh, dramatically, a reliably high uh, likelihood of, of uh, Alzheimer's or of any other condition that is either mentally or physically disabling. So I will, um, I will leave it there. And to Hank, do you want this? Please. stand here. Yeah. Shut that off. Ah, much better. So I want to talk about the wisdom, uh, if I can use that term after today, of such a test, of what the pluses and minuses might be at a number of different levels for a number of different reasons. Again, we are being hypothetical and somewhat speculative. Right now, we do not have a great predictive test for Alzheimer's disease. For most people, there are some rare forms of early onset Alzheimer's disease for which there's very powerful genetic testing involving genes other than APOE, but that's very rare. For most of us, we can give you a range of probabilities, but the probabilities are going to be somewhere between 10% and 60%. They're not going to be 0% or 100% or even 2% or 98%. Assume in the future that changes and using whether it's the PET scanning for amyloid plaque, serum or, or cerebral spinal fluid markers, genetic <laughs> testing, or more likely, many of those in combination, assume that we're able to say with 90% accuracy that you will or will not be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the next 10 years. Let me drop a footnote here, by the way. I don't think we'll ever be able to get to that accuracy that you will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease if we're looking at an older population. Because if you're looking at, say, 70-year-olds, there's a good chance that many of them will die from something else before they get Alzheimer's disease. So we could tell them, yes, there's a very high probability that you will get Alzheimer's disease sometime in the next 10 years. But if you die in the next five years, that may be irrelevant for you and may have only have uh, increased your anxiety. But leave that aside for a second. Assume we've got this fairly sensitive and fairly specific test. What follows? Well, first, if there are interventions, it takes on a whole nother perspective. If there are interventions to stave off the disease, medical interventions, where it makes a difference whether you're at high risk or not, say it's a medical intervention with some risk to it, you wouldn't want to give it to everybody. You wouldn't want to put it in the water supply. But you would want to target people who actually are at higher risk for the disease. Then I think it does become, so to speak, a no-brainer. If there's a way to prevent the disease that only works if we know that you're going to get the disease, it seems very hard to pass that up. Unfortunately, one of the things we've learned from the explosion in biosciences in the last 30 or 40 years is oftentimes the last thing we learn about any disease is how to prevent it or how to cure it. We learn lots of things about its natural history, and being able to predict it, and so on, before we learn how to intervene very successfully medically. What else might you do to intervene? Well, Mike has pointed out there are a lot of financial planning interventions. 
although what percentage of the population will have enough assets to make that relevant outside of Silicon Valley and the peninsula is not entirely clear to me, but at least a significant number of people for whom there are financial interventions that might be useful. There are also the sort of lifestyle interventions that Mike talked about, making a decision whether to retire early or not, making a decision about what to do with your 401k, making the decision to go see Angle Watt or whatever it is that you really want to see. Those are relevant considerations as well. So those interventions, I think, are almost all on the plus side. But there may be some things on the negative side, too. I want to talk about those in at least three categories, so broader social, familial, and personal. It's broader social issues. Yes, you might be interested in whether you're going to get Alzheimer's disease or not, but there might be other people who are interested as well. Some of those people might be, for example, insurers. Now, everybody likes to beat up on insurers, and I've done my share of beating up on insurers too. But insurers actually do have a plausible argument here, at least in some contexts. Consider, for example, long-term care insurers. People who are trying to make a living in this business of long-term care insurance, which may or may not ultimately work out, I think, still unclear. Um, they need to be able to predict how much money it's going to cost them to cover the people they sell the policies to. They face a very real problem called adverse selection. Named, unfortunately, from the perspective of the insurance company, it's adverse to the insurance company. People who think they're going to need the insurance are more likely to buy the insurance. As long as the people who think they're going to need the insurance don't actually know very much, that's not a very big problem. But once you get people who can say, you know, I'm 90% likely to get Alzheimer's disease in the next 10 years, and they're the ones who disproportionately start buying long-term care insurance, then the long-term care insurers better know that so they can increase their rates, or they're going to go bankrupt. They need to do one of two things. They either need to be able to screen out or charge more, do medical underwriting for people who know they are at high risk, or they're going to have to raise their rates across the board. If they raise their rates across the board, that makes it all the more likely that the only people who will buy long-term care insurance are the people who are really going to need it. And you get in what's called in the insurance industry a death spiral, where the rates keep going up and up and up, and as the rates go up, only the people who are at most risk, who are being most expensive, are going to buy the insurance. Now, that's long-term care insurance. There may be some issues with health insurance. There certainly may be some issues with life insurance, disability insurance in particular. This is mitigated a little bit because of the age spectrum we're talking about. Health insurance is not as big an issue for people who are over 65, which is going to be where most of the Alzheimer's population will be. Disability insurance probably isn't as big an issue for a population that's not expecting to be working as much. So they're mitigated to some extent, but there can be some insurance implications. Those insurance implications are interestingly covered or not covered by existing law. There is GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So if we're predicting Alzheimer's disease using APOE4 or PSN or any of the other genes associated with it, you're covered by GINA. And you can't be discriminated against in the provision of health insurance or employment based on genetic information. If we're making a prediction with exactly the same degree of accuracy and we're doing it with a PET scan, you're not covered by GINA. So how the prediction gets made makes a difference. If we're using PET scan plus family history, though, family history is covered by GINA. So complex and not very logical working out of how the legal system tracks to insurance discrimination. Leaving aside the additional issue, GINA doesn't cover long-term care insurance, only covers health insurance. And of course, long-term care insurance, arguably they have a uh, an appropriate reason to be concerned about adverse selection. So there's insurance discrimination possibilities. There are employment discrimination possibilities. Now, it may be, again, given the age distribution of people who are likely to be getting Alzheimer's disease, employment participation is lower at that group. Part of this may depend on how far out your prediction can be made. So people in their 50s might be still planning for 10 or 20 years more of employment, but may find themselves discriminated against based on Alzheimer's risk. 
In a lot of work contexts, that's probably not going to be such a big issue if people are relatively easy to fire. If you're looking at, say, hiring a lateral tenured faculty member, you might actually be kind of interested in whether or not he or she is going to develop Alzheimer's disease fairly soon. If you're the President of the United States and you're thinking of appointing someone to the Supreme Court, you might be really interested in whether that person is going to be developing Alzheimer's fairly soon. Since one thing that seems clear in recent Supreme Court nominations is presidents, if they could, would love to appoint teenagers to get as many <laughs> possible years of influence on the court as they can. Or, to flip it in another direction, if you, and I literally mean here, you or us, are thinking of picking somebody to be the President of the United States, wouldn't we be interested in their risk of Alzheimer's disease? We have relatively recent experience of a president who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's shortly after he left office, who I think it is fair to say may well have been showing some symptoms of Alzheimer's while he was in office. Now, we can't legally force people who run for office to disclose it, but if there's enough demand from the public and if one candidate for one party produces his records, there'll be a lot of pressure on others to produce their records. Should we allow that? Should we not allow that? Should we encourage it? Should we discourage it? It's the kind of question that doesn't come up unless or until you've got the test. But once you've got the test, it might be a pretty significant question. So there are employment issues, there are sort of special employment issues, some of these broader social questions. Family questions. Power dynamics within families. Do you really want to get the test? And if so, do you really want to tell anybody else in your family? Now, presumably with the financial planning, if you're married, uh, this, this is a family endeavor, right? So your spouse or partner would have to know. But how much do you want your spouse to know about your health risks? Do you want to share this in the hopes that this will make your relationship stronger? Are you afraid of sharing it in the fear that she'll walk out? Or maybe not walk out, but facing this future of seeing the need to care for you may become a little emotionally distant. The relationship changes. Beyond spouses, what about children? I understand that one of the major fights in families where a parent has Alzheimer's disease involves taking away the car keys. And when the kids decide, you know, decide dad can't drive anymore. Well, if you have a prediction that you are likely to get Alzheimer's, that's giving some of your power away to the other people who know that. Is that something you want to do? Is it not something you want to do? These family dynamics, I think, are grossly underestimated when we talk about people's decision making about predictions. In talking for years to people from families with genetic diseases, if you push very, you don't have to push very hard to see that they're much less really worried about employment discrimination and insurance discrimination then they are worried about what the effects of this information will be on their family members and on their relationships with their family members. But that takes us to the last level, personal. What's the psychological effect on you? Will it throw you into depression? If you uh, test negative, will that make you elated? Uh, will it change how you live your life? Will it change how you live your life in ways that you think are good or ways that you think are bad? Will it mean if you test positive, that the next time you forget where you parked your car, you're going to be worrying every time you do that, which at my age seems to be every time I park my car, <laughs> that this is the first symptom. You know, I'm on my way down. On the other hand, if you test negative, maybe you won't feel that way. The this has been begun to be explored significantly in some of the genetic testing world. And the good news is, on average, people after they've gotten test results, say a year or so after they've gotten test results, they seem to return pretty much to whatever their previous level of happiness was. This is a broader apparent psychological truth that almost whatever happens to people, if they survive it after a year or two, they return. Ha happy people go back to being happy and unhappy people go back to being unhappy on average. But there are exceptions to the averages and people sometimes do rash and destructive things in that period before they adjust. And I think one of the intriguing things about this issue is how confident can any of us be about how we would react to it? I kind of think maybe I know how I would react, but until I'm confronted with it, I don't really know what my personal psychological reactions would be. So those are, I think, some of the considerations.
both at the social level and the personal level about what the availability of this kind of testing would be. Let me add one last point. How will we regulate it? Who's going to get to decide whether or not you get tested or not? With what kind of counseling? With what kind of medical follow-up? So for example, Frank pointed out that APOE status uh, is now available through 23andMe. They actually don't make it available as part of their, they don't disclose it as part of their normal panel. There's sort of a special checkbox you have to check because they got so much grief for making it available at all. But they don't require that you get any kind of counseling about what it means. They don't require that you have it, that it go through a physician or you have any kind of counseling at all about what the implications are. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Now, APOE is thus far not very powerful in terms of a predictor. Yes, it can increase your risks twofold, threefold, or fourfold, but not past about 60% so far. What if we get much better predictors? Should we regulate how that information gets conveyed and provided? Should we regulate who gets to provide it? These are questions that we have not yet begun to confront. I don't think they're questions special to Alzheimer's testing. They're questions that are coming up throughout biomedicine as we are understanding more about diseases, we are seeing more, we're increasing our ability to predict diseases. I'm not even sure prediction is quite the right term here. It's almost as if we're talking about diagnosing asymptomatic disease. It's not that we're predicting that you'll get Alzheimer's, we're saying you are in the early stages of Alzheimer's, such early stages that you're not showing any symptoms of it. As we get better and better at doing this in a whole range of areas, we need to sort of to start confronting what we will do with this information, or better yet, how we can try to govern this information in ways that make it likely that for any given individual, and I do think people are likely to differ in their answers here, that that information is more likely to help them than it is to hurt them. As an academic, my general bias is information is good and more information is better. But in my personal life, I'm not at all sure that that's true. So I think we're done with this, uh, with our presentations. We'll be happy to take your questions. I talk probably louder enough yeah. anyway, like but, all teachers. Not, not loud enough to get across the whole world wide web, though. Uh, <laughs> so I guess you heard my question, right? Yes. Without the uh, loudspeaker? So the question is, is are there any ways to prevent it? Yes, mm -hmm. or slow it down. Or slow it down, sure. Right. Well, we can start with prevention. I can take one through a, a tour. Um, there's one intervention that's probably the most powerful one that we, we have at this point. Um, the side effects of it are reducing depression, reducing diabetes, reducing hypertension. Reducing weight. Uh, and reducing weight. And uh, that, that, that intervention is called exercise. Very, very biologically potent treatment exercise. Um, the epidemiologic studies estimate that, that people who do the kind of exercise that would be along the lines of the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, you know, not crazy things. So 30, 40 minutes a day, five or six days a week, about a 50% reduction in the chance of uh, getting Alzheimer's or other dementias. If we had a drug that we could market as reducing your odds by 50% and its side effects were to reduce diabetes and high blood pressure, I'm sure many people would pay a lot of money to, to be on that drug. This particular treatment, though, is hard to convince people to take, um, and, and, and I'm not sure why. An interesting study would be to, to know if you had an APOE4 allele, the high-risk yield, and people are doing these studies now, can that be a tool to get people to take this treatment? So I'd rank exercise as the number one most biologically potent. Uh, number two would be the so-called Mediterranean diet. 
a lot of epidemiology on that. Again, not anything extreme, but a along the lines of a little bit less meats, a little bit less <coughs> uh, uh, fats, um, trans fats, um, more of the vegetables and, and things. Maybe risk reductions on the whole of say 30 percent, 25, 30 percent, something like that. And then the third one, the I like third is cognitive activity, you know, cognitive stimulation. I rank third. That's the one that seems to get the most play. You know, quote doing quote crosswords puzzles or buying software to stay cognitively active. The, the studies there are, are mixed. It's hard to support that, um, and, I, and I would rank that third. Uh, what stuns me in my clinic is when people spend hundreds of hours on the internet uh, looking for uh, the latest treatments, uh, strategies to prevent dementia, pay a lot of money at the health food store, and I just asked a simple question, are you getting any exercise? No. Um, it's just, it's, it's, like, it's like smoking and going to a lung doctor. Um, you know, we're, we're, unfortunately, we're designed to, to cover six miles a day or so, and when we don't, that's a pathologic, you know, condition. You know, walking. So, and then there's other things we can try. I think soon there'll be drugs uh, that can delay onset also. As, uh, as clinicians, uh, when you see the patients, with, let's say, with the early onset or whatever, do you encourage them to do that? Yes. So now yes. I'm a big fan for exercise. As yes. No, I think, so. I think as we were talking about these curves, the later we wait, the less effective any intervention probably would be. My bias would be that exercise it would still be worth it even in early stages. So I encourage all of my patients uh, to walk. You too? Absolutely. And there Get is, them all onto the squash courts. Right. That's very good. And there is evidence that even in the context of dementia, it can slow the weight, right. not necessarily of cognitive decline, but at least of functional decline. And the line that I always have with patients is that this is the most important factor in determining when you go to a nursing home. And that mm -hmm. speaks to people. Well, this is true actually for all individuals about dementia in general. But I just wonder whether Alzheimer's is a special type of dementia when you cannot reverse, when you, when you cannot prevent. Do you, wh what's your thinking about that? There are kind of a, just general dementia, the aging brain so-called, but, but yeah. Alzheimer's is some, something else. What's your thinking about that? We know the most about Alzheimer's just because it's so incredibly common. Um, there are a number of other neurodegenerative diseases, and it's likely that exercise and all, all these same things that we've talked about probably influence the risk for dementia with Lewy bodies and frontotemporal dementia. Less is known about those other dementias and their interaction with lifestyle. I'd, I'd say we probably know more about the exercise effect on Alzheimer's than the other ones. So I, I think it's, it's very relevant. I, I see. So it's good. Yes. It works. Yes. Okay. In your uh, dementia workup slide, you talked about looking at B12 levels, at thyroid levels, at MRIs, and um, I guess that, that would give you 85% uh, diagnostic accuracy. So I'm kind of trying to put that information together with um, uh, Professor Greeley. You mentioned that 10 to 60%, that what you'd get is a 10 to 60% probability of getting the disease. So, so I was talking about the ability to predict who's going to get the disease. And Jeff was talking about your ability to say that somebody with particular dementia has Alzheimer's dementia versus some other cause, right? So you're predicting the disease way before any symptoms, just looking at genetic information, is that what you Either mean? genetic or the biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid or the PET scan. Okay. Be before there are functional symptoms. Okay, and you're talking about looking at symptoms and then, and then doing this workup to see. That's right, at the stage that somebody has a full-blown dementia, it's not such a difficult thing to diagnose Alzheimer's disease clinically. Um, but, but that's right. We're talking about people who either have very mild symptoms where it's difficult to differentiate from normal aging or better yet, people who have no symptoms at all and are just worried about their risk in the coming decade. That's a harder puzzle. And so, and so if somebody came to you with no symptoms, then you could determine with 85% accuracy by doing this workup or you could... No, no, not yet. 
Somebody killed you with no symptoms, she could determine with 100% accuracy that they're not demented. Right. <laughs> but, whether, but whether there's Alzheimer's disease bubbling below the surface and is preclinical and not producing any symptoms yet, that's a hard puzzle to solve. Got it. Jeff, I wanted to follow that for a second. Uh, on the amyloid plaque buildup, the PET mm -hmm. scan for amyloid plaque, um, it's, let's see, specific but not sensitive? It's sensitive but not specific, sensitive, but not so specific. a lot of people have amyloid right. plaques and would have a positive amyloid PET scan, but we don't know how many of them will go on to become demented. So if you've got a 60-year-old who shows no amyloid plaque buildup, would you not be fairly confident in predicting he or she is not going to get Alzheimer's disease within X years, realizing that the X right now is uncertain? Yeah, I, I think so that is you should be able to predict fairly well who's not going to get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Just not who's, of all the people with amyloid plaque buildup, we don't know who is going to get it. That's correct. And even that test could be significant. I mean, you might not, if you've got two candidates you're equally enamored of, and one uh, has amyloid plaque and one doesn't, that might make a difference for you. <laughs> it's, right, it's very useful from a clinical trial standpoint. Um, yeah. Uh, that's right. There are lots of ways to be the method. Yeah. But just gets rid of the most common. Right. <clears throat> Law school, arguably, is a way to become demented. <laughs> Differently mented. Thanks a lot. This has been a fascinating way to close. Um, I had a lot of points, but I'll just try to boil some of these down. One, one is a, a cautionary note. I think we're looking at specificity and sensitivity here, and I think some of the claims about uh, yes, we would know that that person doesn't have, will not be at risk for dementia is not necessarily true. And as a reminder, I mean, you look at what happened with prostate cancer tests, PSA testing, which is now no longer recommended, or uh, endocrine replacement for women. Uh, same problem, we're, we're looking at cohorts moving forward without that certainty. So I just, I want to caution, I guess, everybody here that we won't know. We'll have tests that will indicate likelihood. But I think some of the effects that will come up are, are very important, the modifiable factors, especially since the obesity epidemic in this country is estimated to cause a number of million more cases of dementia due to multi-infarct, as well as Alzheimer's, because that puts people more at risk. Um, I guess I was also thinking about, the, no one mentioned the uh, woman about 10 years ago who had her fetuses test, I'm sorry, her embryos tested. She was undergoing infertility treatment. She had her embryos tested for the ApoE4 allele mm -hmm. and wanted, wanted uh, her OB to discard the ones that were positive um, because early onset Alzheimer's had decimated her family. And so that raised a lot of issues. But just to, to further cast into the future, I mean, I think about the movie Gattaca a lot. I, I teach ethics and neuroethics to pre-meds and undergraduates and medical students. Um, you know, thinking again about the world that Hank was, I think, asking us to envision what are some of the other possible fallouts? This would only be one test, presumably, of many that would provide biological markers. And the use of those markers will be, could be fairly widespread in society, could be very helpful to individuals, but could be you know, tremendously misused. Or in the movie Gattaca, you know, you're looking at a society that's very driven. It's, there's a biological imperative on, on pretty much everything. And I guess I'd ask the panel to further imagine that world a bit, because we can, you know, with some probability estimate living in that world as we get older. I think it's going to happen. Um, and again, not because anybody wants Gattaca to happen. Actually, I think, I, I don't, didn't really like the movie Gattaca. I've never seen the whole thing. I thought it was a little more exaggerated than I can imagine us going. But I do think that our ability to predict a whole range of, of phenotypes, whether they're diseases or non-disease traits, is increasing substantially. And in many of these cases, there will be strong reasons for individuals to be interested in them. Our knowledge is increasing not, I think, fundamentally, because we want to learn how to predict these things, although in some cases we do, but mainly because we want to understand them. But as part of understanding, we get this, this predictive, the genie gets out of the bottle. And uh, I think we'll have to decide this. I'm actually working on a book right now, uh, plug, uh, called The End of Sex. Yeah. Good title? Bad title? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I think that I think within 20 to 40 years, we are going. Uh, most parent, most children will be conceived by in vitro fertilization, so that parents can use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. 
using eggs derived from stem cells to get around the difficulties of uh, egg retrieval. So I think we're definitely headed in that direction. Um, I, I don't know that that direction is going to change, but I think uh, whether we get there with more or less protection remains to be seen. I mean, I think your question bears on the, you know, renting the air of personalized medicine, right? Um, so the one size fits all will quickly fall to the wayside. I mean, for me to see you in our, in our memory disorders clinic without knowing having your DNA sequence will fairly soon be the old days. Gee, I would have treated you just the same as the next patient. How could we have done that? Um, so we'll, we'll have your entire sequence. We'll have it on, a, on, a, on the cloud somewhere, and I, I wouldn't even begin to treat you without knowing something about it. So all of these things will, will become available, and what will really push that are the therapeutic options. So right now, it's not considered ethical to do genetic testing on somebody who's under 18. It should be, one should, as an adult, make an informed decision of whether or not you want someone looking at your DNA. However, if you have a gene that will make you risk, at risk for a disease that is with an onset of age 8 or 10 or 12, you don't want to wait to 18, Somebody has to make a decision on that, on that genetic testing. So, and if there's a therapy that can prevent it, uh, we can't wait till 18. So uh, kids will have more genetic testing, very difficult decision. The pre-implantation, of course, as you might have already done with autosomal dominant uh, genes like Huntington's disease, if you inherit the abnormal version of the disease, you have a 100% risk that during your lifetime you'll get that. So there are parents that have done pre-implantation testing of, of of those blastocyst cells, and if they have the unknown Huntington's gene, they're not going with that one for the for the for the, for the implantation. But for a risk gene, that's a different scary um, equation. But I think it'll, in the clinic, we'll be looking at all these genes. Go ahead. Well, I'm trying to uh, exercise, and I'm <laughs> trying to eat a Mediterranean diet. We had a pretty nice one for lunch this morning. For <laughs> totally Mediterranean, and uh, I'm very cognitively stimulated by this group. <laughs> and I normally avoid politics and big news stuff and such, but there's a thing called socialized medicine, which has been discussed for a long time. And I've kind of stayed away from that argument. But especially hearing uh, you talking about some of the legal implications of what we have to do. And Hank talking about, I think, the very important issues of who else is going to know about this information. These are, are very, very important issues, I think. And we talk a lot today about transparency. The internet is making things more transparent. Politically, this is changing much of the world. And at home here in the United States now, it's certainly changing the way our children socialize, our workers socialize, the way we all think and, and work. And the politicians, I'm surprised that they don't have total transparency right now on everything they've ever done since they were in diapers. And the fact that they may someday have the transparency of whether or not their tau is OK, or they got amyloids, uh, I think that will eventually come. If it does, then doesn't this kind of mean the only way as a society we can really handle that is by having some kind of agreed, no longer having independent health insurance, because nobody's going to be able to get insurance, except that somebody who's unbelievably well-tested and perfect. Everybody else is going to be paying through the nose. So if that's the case, it seems like a strong argument for socialized medicine Uh, I, I mean, actually, I think that's another uh, no-brainer. Um, but for a whole bunch of reasons, we're the only rich country in the world that doesn't guarantee all of our residents' health care. Um, this is an aspect of American exceptionalism that I, for one, could do without. And I think ultimately we're moving in the right direction. Whether we get there before, you know, during my lifetime remains to be seen. But this is one of many reasons why the idea of individually underwritten coverage is increasingly passe. 
So, you know, the closest thing we have to that, in a way, is, is Medicaid. Now, you know, you have to be 65 or over or under 65 and disabled and qualified, but that's our, you know, for that gigantic group, I mean, that is socialized medicine. We are subsidizing it. You have to, you know, you, there's no real eligibility criteria. There's no screening. So we do have it, and that is going bankrupt as the way, in terms of how it's now funded. You know, there's no controls. You've all seen these, you know, the, the, the charts showing how bankrupt it is when we're going to absolutely run out of money. Actually, so, that's bankrupt in the country. The problem is people in the middle that don't qualify, mm -hmm. they're being personally bankrupt. Well, and I guess the point being made is that, yeah, the more testing there is, the pool becomes smaller and smaller. It, that's right. I think that push is, is inevitable. Two more questions, and then... Uh, Told these panels they would be done in three. Oh, we're fine. We're fine. Uh, yeah. To follow up on Professor Greeley, I was wondering what is the consensus or lack of consensus about who owns genomic information? Is my personal information? Is my personal information when someone comes up with a designer gene that's able to turn on the onset of Alzheimer's and they have proprietary rights to that gene and then you inject it to my own? My own genome, I'm going to be passing on my understanding to have my genome. Have I then forfeited some of their property ownership or their information? Is this something that is foreseeable? I, I think it's fair to say there is no conventional wisdom about who owns your genome, uh, who has rights over genetics. Sequences of different sorts in different contexts varies. Right now, genetic sequences are patentable in the United States and in many other countries, although there's some Supreme Court decisions coming up which might affect that. Even the patents, though, don't affect your ownership of what's in you. And so myriad genetics can't come in and, and, and require you to pay a, uh, pay a royalty for having a functional BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. So in that respect, at least, you're free from that. But the whole issue of ownership in the sense of patenting is somewhat up in the air at this point. Uh, more broadly, ownership questions, I think, are perhaps better analyzed in terms of, of not ownership as a, as a whole idea, but bits and pieces. We like in property class to talk about ownership as a bundle of properties, a bundle of sticks of different rights and obligations. And which ones you have vary, and, that can, and that's up in the air right now. Your, your question raises the fascinating um, question of, of and to owning the knowledge of your genome. And we get into one uh, dilemma we call the obligate carrier. So let's say you're 65. You, you don't want to know your APOE status. You're one of the ones that say, I don't want to know it. But your 25-year-old daughter did her 23 of me, and she found out she's E4, E4. Both of her alleles are E4. So she, you, don't, you don't want to know yours. She comes home one day and says, Dad, guess what? I'm E4, E4. Well, guess what you just found out? <laughs> well, maybe you found out that you're not her genetic father. That's the only thing. That's the only thing. That's the So we actually deal with that in our clinics. Um, <laughs> so it gets, it gets complex, yeah. Uh, and just as a quick follow-up, yeah. I mean, even inside it, I know there seems to be a consensus no, notion of what a gene is, but inside the science, you know, as we're parlaying this. <laughs> it, it is. Um, there are problems with these concepts. Although we don't usually, the patent office doesn't give you a patent on a gene, it gives you a patent typically on a certain sequence. And the sequence, at least, we can define. Whether we know what it means is another question. Whether we know what the epigenetics, how the epigenetics affect it is another question. But um, we will typically, in law, try to find something we can define whether that's actually what the important thing is or not. because. If you can't define it, it's harder to regulate it. I guess it's down to me. So you it's a heavy responsibility, Ken. <laughs> I'll try to do my best here. So you've kind of started out with a very broad, uh, broad question here, and it's actually been fascinating. I guess I was going to ask to predict in a little bit farther. If we start to look at you know, where the legal challenges are going to come up in terms of uh, genomic prediction of diseases, maybe Alzheimer's, maybe not. Where do you see the beachhead occurring? Where, where do you see those first cases hitting the legal system uh, in, in all likelihood? Well, I think they 
already have to some extent, not in a huge way, with genetic prediction. There have been a few cases brought uh, claiming genetic discrimination. There weren't very many until Gina passed. Uh, and there still aren't very many really well-documented cases, but I understand there are now something like two or 300 complaints before the EEOC of genetic discrimination in employment. Now, there's a big difference between complaints and proven cases, uh, but I suspect at least some of those complaints will translate into proven cases. Uh, and they are, they are, Usually they've been things, they've been, uh, the complaints are about genes that have a fairly strong connection to a fairly serious disease like Huntington's disease, like BRCA1 or BRCA2 and breast or ovarian cancer. I think there's been at least one with some of the genes involved in uh, Lynch syndrome for colorectal cancer. Um, but then every once in a while, one of the few cases out there is just a stupid one involving Burlington Northern testing for carpal tunnel with testing a particular gene that they thought was associated with carpal tunnel syndrome, which wasn't. I mean, they had, it, it, was, it was a brain dead, stupid decision. So sometimes you can see, you can predict what people logically will do, but people often do things that aren't very logical. Uh, I think that you'll see high penetrance, so things where the genotype uh, heavily predicts the phenotype, that have some significant, that, that to predict a high probability of some syndrome or condition which an employer or an insurer would be very interested in, i.e. something that would be significantly disabling or significantly expensive. And, uh, and so given that, do you think that, like you have to go take a drug test when you start a job, or you have to take a genetic test when you start a job? Well, right now, Gina makes that impossible. Gina makes that illegal, I should say. Uh, murder's been illegal for a long time, but it hasn't become impossible. Uh, whether that will begin to change or not. And there are some exceptions for uh, safety issues. So there is a, there's some genetic variations that are associated with um, sudden cardiac death uh, syndrome, uh, where often the first symptom of people who have this in their 30s or 40s is they drop dead, and there is no second symptom. Uh, there is some concern or some interest that maybe for health and safety purposes for some professions, Pilots, although, you know, pilots always have co-pilots. I actually think bus drivers who don't have co-pilots, maybe school bus drivers, may be scarier than pilots for something like this. There may be pressure as we learn more to expand these kinds of health and safety exceptions more broadly to take into account um, other kinds of risks uh, that do have some more immediate implications. You know, along those lines, one thing we worry about as being physicians in a clinic is as we obtain this knowledge of, of risks of, of Alzheimer's coming on or in a more uh, dramatic genetic disorder like Huntington's disease, so now we have this knowledge that at some point this person will become cognitively impaired or, or is likely to, but they're in a very challenging job as an air traffic controller, surgeon, et cetera. And these symptoms come on subtly, and usually the, the first things that the, that the symptoms affect are a complex, challenging endeavor. Rather than losing your car, you'll make a mistake in your professional line of work. And when that mistake occurs and hurts somebody, um, was it okay that we had the knowledge that that might happen someday, and w were we obliged to do anything about it? Um, what could we do about it? And I've been in that situation with Huntington's uh, uh, genetic testing where the, the gene came back as abnormal. I knew that person at some point would have onset of Huntington's, which does involve cognition. And they were in these very um, high risk, high demand um, uh, positions. Uh, what does one do with that knowledge? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but as physicians, we worry about that. We're already in the challenging uh, point of view of as a physician, when we see a person has uh, any impairment that's likely to affect driving, mm -hmm. uh, history of syncope, fainting, or we're making a diagnosis of, of dementia, we're required by law in California uh, to report that. Uh, that. That information gets to the DMV. That puts us in a very difficult position with somebody who's driving, who's not having any trouble driving, whose day-to-day -day life depends on driving, and now we're in the position of having affected that. 
It's a very difficult decision, but it would be an even more difficult decision if that person went out and got in an accident and killed somebody. Uh, so we follow the law and we report it. So we're already you know, struggling with these things, but I think it's just the beginning. When you come to my clinic and give me your entire genome, and I see three dozen of these on there that I know will lead to a problem at some point, um, I, think, I think cases will arise from that. That's a that's the safest prediction I've heard today. <laughs> Cases will arise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so since I'm the last question and Hank is uh, on the panel, I'd like everybody to thank the panelists. <laughs> yeah. The agenda says that from three to three thirty I sum up, and that was always a lie. Uh, I want to spend about three minutes, is all, and not so much summing up as um, thanking. Uh, I think this has been a really interesting day, and I think it's been a really nice conclusion to a two-day event. I'm really pleased with the idea of building stronger connections between the various institutions here in the Bay Area. We arguably live in the greatest intellectual center in the world, uh, particularly in the biosciences, but we like to think in the law world, we do pretty well too. And yet, you know, Hastings is 40 minutes away, plus another hour for parking. <laughs> Berkeley is an hour away plus another two hours for part. <laughs> and yet our interactions between these great universities uh, are not nearly as good as I think they should be. Uh, we need to try to improve that both for our, intellect, our own intellectual growth and I like to think for the betterment of the world because the more brains we put together in these things, the better we're likely to do. So I want, really want to thank David Fagman. David, stand up. <laughs> who is the, the prime moving force behind this uh, whole conference for pushing it. And I hope it will be a beginning and not an end of increasing interdisciplinary and, and interinstitutional work. It's important that the disciplines talk to each other. And what you're doing with Hastings and UCSF, I think, is great. I think Stanford has been maybe a bit ahead of the curve in terms of our culture of interdisciplinarity compared to some places. But it's not just disciplines talking to each other, but institutions and people in institutions talking to each other that I think we need to do. Um, we are in, in that great cliched phrase, we are in a brave new world. It's not so much that it's personalized medicine. I was a little surprised to hear you use that term, Frank, because my wife, who's a physician, mm -hmm. hates that. She says, I've been practicing medicine for 25 years, and I've always been practicing personalized medicine. Yeah. It's really more genomically personalized Genomic medicine. Personalized that we're moving into. But with all of these, with more information comes more options. Some of those options are going to be useful to the extent they can prevent and treat disease. Some of them are going to be potentially pernicious, and some of them are going to have effects that we, can, we can't even guess at at this point. To me, I think that means we need more discussions between scientists, physicians, lawyers, and others about what those implications are going to be. The one thing we know for sure about predicting the future is we're not very good at it. But I like to think that we are better at it if we pay attention to it and think about it. And the more rigorously we think about it, we think about what the problems will be and what kind of interventions we may have at the personal, institutional, and social level, the more likely we are to maximize the benefits or minimize the harms. That's how I used to think about it. Now I've taken a more modest approach. The more likely we are to avoid major catastrophes. And if all we can do is avoid major catastrophes in the implementations of these new technologies, that's not such a bad thing. So thank you for being part of this conference. Uh, thank you very much to uh, David and the UCSF people for their part of it. Thanks to Trish Gertrude and our program group. Special thanks to Ken Smith, not only as our first speaker of the day, but as the main uh, force for making sure that something happened here at Stanford, uh, nagging me uh, Perhaps not as much as he should have, but at least enough to get things done. And thank all of you for coming. And with that, we close. Thank you. Thank you.